Okay, so our next speaker today is Paul McKenney. Uh, Paul McKenney is an engineer at IBM and has worked on shared memory operating systems kernel algorithms for longer than he cares to admit. Uh, he's recently become quite interested in getting real-time response from mid-range multi-core and multi-threaded systems while still maintaining good performance and scalability. And on that note, he's going to talk to us today about simplicity through optimization. So please welcome Paul McKinney. Thank you, Evan. Uh, this is uh, sort of an exception, but uh, we always like to report on exceptions. It doesn't always work this way, but this time it did. So I'm going to go through uh, first a puzzle from 1984. Just, I mean, the LCA people gave us puzzles hidden in somewhere, so I figured if they could, I was entitled as well. Uh, and uh, we'll look a little bit about why optimization tends to go bad and why. And then we'll look at two phases of RCU's evolution, the going bad phase for about 15 years, and then uh, some redemption of itself over the past year. Uh, finally, uh, next steps for RCU and some lessons learned. So, a uh, puzzle from 1984, and by the way, I do mean the book, not the year, or the year, not the book, excuse me. How many people actually read uh, George Orwell's 1984 before 1984? <laughs> yeah, okay, how many people read George Orwell's 1984 back when it was still plausible that things might turn out that way in 1984? Okay, I, I guess I'm not the oldest person in the room, or I'm not the only old person in the room then, yeah. I re first read it in the late 60s, so, you know, I was, you know, it might actually have turned out that way, right? But uh, we're talking about the year in this case, so by the time uh, this situation showed up, it was very clear that uh, George Orwell's dystopia was not going to come to pass. But uh, um, another guy myself did have our own personal computational dystopia. We had a, uh, as you can see, a rather small machine, rather slow machine. Uh, if you typed uh, anything, even if you did slash bin slash true, 1001, 1002, 1003, prompt, okay? Uh, and this meant that there were a number of coding techniques people used to avoid actually executing any programs in your shell script, so it didn't take forever. But uh, we did, they, they did take pity on us. They gave us a larger disk, and of course that meant we need to rearrange things, you know, uh, uh, reformat the file system and so on, and that worked wonderfully. We suddenly actually had room, some free space on a disk instead of being crammed up to the limit. Uh, except that after a couple weeks, we'd have this file. You, you could be even, you, you made a new file, you looked at it and it was there. You compiled it, you get all sorts of errors. And you look at it and it's some kind of garbage. Uh, we were kind of under the gun. We had a deadline to meet. Uh, we wasted far too much time reconfiguring the machine. So we, uh, kind of swept another rug, uh, we, we created a .bad directory, and every file that showed any sign of corruption, we threw it in the .bad directory, and, and after a few days, everything was fine. So the, the, and I'll go through a few slides, let you time to think about it. The question is, and, and the thing we thought at the time was it was a hardware problem, which was a pretty good guess at that time, but it wasn't, we'd, we'd messed up. We'd, we'd done something really stupid. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to some few slides and see if anybody can, uh, uh, some of you guys that actually read 1984 back when it was plausible that 1984 might actually happen in 1984, maybe uh, uh, you can draw back on deep experience and see what we did. So in general, why does optimization go bad and why does it go bad? The thing is there's a really powerful optimization strategy. And that strategy is to take advantage of special cases. And you see this in compilers, you see it in coding, you see it all over the place. Um, let's see, well, I've got several cases. This one's complicated, this one's really easy, so oh, I'm in this case, yes, I am, great, do the simple thing, get done with it. The problem, of course, is that uh, special cases, by definition, are special. And if you keep doing this, if you end up with a situation like Linux kernel, where it's used everything from cell phones to supercomputers, um, so it, in some sense, has to deal with the general case, after a while, you end up with something like this. Your code is structured something like this. You have some kind of special case selection dispatch. Um, is the right thing happening? If so, okay, well, which special case am I in? One, two, three, four, or five? Okay, go do that thing, come back out. So you end up with uh, some pretty serious code bloat. You're handling the problem in five different ways, sometimes many more. Plus, you have this dispatch code that has to be really, really fast. You don't, you don't want to give up all the performance you gain by taking advantage of the special case, after all. 
uh, and uh, this, this can get out of hand. Nonetheless, specialization and special cases, again, are an extremely powerful optimization technique, so this is something we do a lot. And this is exactly, as we'll see, what happened with RC, one of the reasons it went bad. In the meantime, let's get back to 1984. Again, we had a PDP-1123 running BSD 2.8, uh, and uh, we had uh, gotten a new disk. We had reformatted the disk, made some file systems, and noticed that some of our files were getting corrupted. Uh, being young, crazy, and uh, needing to do something else, we just threw all the bad files, the corrupted files, into a special dot bad directory, and after a while, no problem. Any, any guesses as to what the problem was? Yeah. Was the size of the offset in the disk too small for the disk? That would have been, uh, that would have been something that uh, the other guy and myself might have done at that time, but uh, thankfully we managed to miss making that mistake. But that certainly would be one that would do it. Uh, any, any other uh, thoughts? Yeah. Uh, the corrupted files just happened to land on a bad sector on the disk? That's what we thought. Um, but uh, uh, we were told differently in, uh, shall we say, very uh, 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 non-subtle terms by a competent uh, Linux, uh, Unix hacker who uh, set us straight later. Any other guesses? Yeah, one more guess. Part of a block? Yeah, very good. <laughs> yeah, very good. You see, back in those days, <laughs> he wins the prize. I'm not sure what the prize is, but uh, he wins it. Back in those days, if you wanted to change where the swap partition was, you made a kernel source change, and you rebuilt your kernel and rebooted. And we'd done that. We, we found the place in the kernel where the, we said where the swap was, and we changed and rebuilt the kernel. Uh, we found one of the places in the kernel source <laughs> that you changed. <laughs> and uh, and uh, a guy I went to school with, he was, he's, he, was, he was one of these guys that was just a really brilliant Unix guy back in the early 80s, came and he just, he just reamed us up one side down the other for, for only finding the one instead of the other two. And we happily uh, left, the, left the dealing with the machines to him and, uh, and went back to doing the application at that point. We'd only found one of them again, and uh, the, the big thing is why, why, why should you care today? I mean, that was 1984. I mean, this is back, and we have probing in the Linux kernel today. And as you can imagine, in uh, BSD 2.8, the way you probed was you walked over, opened up the cabinet, and checked where the cards were, and then typed that into the kernel source. You know, so it was a, a manual probe, if you will. Uh, why, why does this matter today? Why do we care about this old crap? Well... Uh, of course, uh, some of you may know where this is leading just knowing who I am and what I work on. Uh, I'll, I'll grant you that. But the thing is, is that this kind of coordinated kernel so uh, source type of manipulation is generally frowned on today. We, we try to avoid that because it's better if people can, if the changes are obvious, you can make them and, and not have people going, breaking things all over the place and screaming at us on whatever mailing list we live on. The other thing is that uh, machines have gotten really cheap and we end up having to take care of a lot more of them. So these things have to fend for themselves a lot better than they used to. They have to be able to adapt to their environment. Uh, in fact, you saw that. I, uh, Evan came and had this little memory stick he wanted me to put my presentation on. I had the thing booted up, I plugged the memory stick in, and my computer said, oh, a memory stick, great, here it is. And I put stuff on it, I unmounted it, and said, okay, you can get rid of it now, I pulled it out. Um, that would have been more complicated on that PDP-1123. <laughs> the PDP-1123 had the rather uh, endearing property that if you tried to mount a file system, a floppy disk, without a floppy disk being in the drive, uh, the kernel would panic. <laughs> Which, uh, uh, since it was a shared machine, um, a, a great way to get everybody in the office really pissed off at you was to uh, try to mount the floppy disk before putting the floppy disk in the drive. Uh, this, this was before VI got the dash R parameter, okay? So everything was just gone. Uh, anyway, so the thing is, is that the way we keep track of this is to, instead of having source code and just read only stuff that gets dumped into the kernel by the programmer, instead we have these data structures throughout the kernel that could change at any time, but almost never change. And there's quite a few of them. So what happens is that today, optimizations for read mostly data of that sort 
are much more important than they were in 1984, and this has affected how we do things and also what the uh, kernel looks like. Uh, of course, this bit about having commodity machines with more than one CPU has had an effect as well in the last few years, you might have noticed. And so, uh, of course, some of you know my favorite read only, read mostly optimization, and uh, of course, this is what the talk will cover on is most of, not all of them. I, I have talked non-RCU talks occasionally, but uh, most of them are on that topic. So first we'll take a look at the time frame from 1993 to about 2008, and this is where RCU was accumulating these kinds of problems, and we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at, a, at how this played out a little bit. Um, this is for the people who are going to read the slides that later. There are three phrases I want you to pay attention to. Read side, RC read side critical section, quiescent state, and grace period. And we'll go to the next slide, which shows a picture, which will be a little easier to deal with. Maybe. Or maybe not. I don't know. Uh, so what we have here is we have five threads. Time is advancing from uh, left to right. And uh, we've got one on the top that's on three RC read side critical sections, one after another across the top there. Uh, the second task has done two of them, and then the next two tasks have done, have done uh, one each. And then the final task is carrying out an update. So there's a couple things to notice here. Uh, we have a read side critical sections which begin with RC read lock and end with RC read unlock. But not too different than lock based critical sections. You start it with a statement, end it with another statement. Anything not in an RC read side critical section is a quiescent state. So we've got one of them marked there, there's a bunch of other ones. The other unusual thing about RCU is that reading happens concurrently with changes. Okay, so we got this guy up there doing RC reads our critical section. He's going through the data structure and it's changing out from under him at the same time, and that's okay. It's designed to make that work. Now, the other, I've, I've covered two of the phrases from the previous slide. One of them was RC reads our critical section, the second was quiescent state, and the third one is grace period. A grace period is any period of time in which every task in the system goes through a quiescent state. And as we can see, there's one task here that didn't. That's that red border around that blue thing there. That, that reset critical section spanned the entire grace period. That's bad. That's not supposed to happen. If that does happen, you have a buggy RC implementation. Um, anybody want to uh, take a guess as to what RCU should have done instead? What, if, this, if this happens, what's RCU supposed to do about it? Go for it, Rusty. Very good. Very good. Like that. And at this point, we've got this grace period here, and you see each task has some yellow in it. Each task has a quiescent state, and so it's legal for it to end. Ah, thank you. Ooh, is this one one I can put my eye out with, or how's this? Uh... Oh, okay. Well, that's a good one then. Except that I'm, oh, here we are. There's the business end of it. And yes, look at that. Thank you, sir. Very good. Okay, so the, the key thing is that a grace period is not permitted to complete until all of the pre-existing readers have completed. So for this grace period, we got that guy there, this guy here, and this guy here. Those three guys were around when the grace period started. So the grace period doesn't get to end until those three guys, that one, that one, and that one, get done. As we can see, that's the case here. If the people that started after the grace period started, it's just plenty fine for the grace period, for those to continue out off the end of the grace period, as these two, in fact, do. So it's kind of a, a, a little bit different spin on it. Instead of clearing everybody out of the pool, we just clear the ones that were out there to begin with. We clear the old guys out of the pool, we let new guys come in. In contrast, if we look at conventional reader-writer locking, uh, again, we have time going across the slide like that. We just got uh, uh, the system state here. It's not like this is one task, it's just the state of the lock. So we start off and, uh, with nobody holding lock, then somebody has a read lock. There's a whole pile of readers maybe for a while. They, the last one unlocks it, then one writer, and it just in phases like that across time. So the difference here, in RCU, while the writer was there, you'd be able to start new readers. You'd have to finish old writers, but you could start new readers. So where reader-writer locking works and breaks time up into phases, read versus write, what RCU does is it splits things and, and this is, I'm not going to go into detail on this. Most of you, I think, are aware that reader writer locking can be quite slow. Uh, but uh, what happens is RCU splits things across time, sort of, but also across space. And space here means the address space. 
So let's go through this example to see how this works. I guess I shouldn't step too much further than that. So we start off with a version of this list. So we have a list here, A, B, and C. Time again is going forward. We're not actually representing the, the threads and tasks that are actually doing the changes. We're just showing the data structure, different snapshots through time. And the uh, vertical dashed lines are separating the different versions uh, of the uh, data structure. So each dashed line re represents a change in state. So we start off with just one version through time, and then we have an updater who wants to change the value of the, of the element B in the list, okay? And the normal way you do that with RCU is you first allocate a new copy, uh, then you make your change, and then you link it back in the list as shown across there. But let's take a look at that in a little more detail. So first the guy makes a new B. He copies it over there, and that copy includes the pointer to C. So we have exactly the same thing. We now have two versions of the list. There's this thing, and there's this thing. The readers can only see the A, B, and C, which is why they're red. Readers could potentially be accessing them. Uh, B is green because there's no way for a reader to get to it. So that means the updater owns that element of the data structure. The readers can't touch it. The next thing that the writer does, so we, so we, have, uh, we have time going this way, but now we have two copies of it. So we have these guys are going to be at different addresses, and that's the split across space. And I went too far in that direction. Anyway, uh, and that's going too far in space, I guess. <laughs> Portion machines have large address spaces, so you have to go a long way before you fall off the end. Now, so the, the first thing it does here is it makes its desired change. And then it links, changes the pointer that points here to now point down here, as we see over here. And uh, low resolution means that you have to imagine the line that's there and the line that's there. Apologize for that, but we ended up with 800 by 600 and I didn't quite make the lines fat enough. The thing is that with all the things that Linux runs on, when you store a pointer, it's an atomic operation in the sense that if you have tasks concurrently reading that pointer, they're gonna see either the old value or the new value, they're not gonna see some mush of the two values. So that means the readers that are coming in at the same time this is happening are either gonna see a pointer to B and see the old list, or they'll see a pointer to B prime and see the new list. They're not gonna go off into space and die. All right? Now, as soon as we make that change, there's no way for new readers to find this element B. The only thing that can possibly be there is the old readers. Okay, which is the whole point behind that definition about how the old reads had critical sections block the gray spree, but not the new ones. And right here you can see that. The old reads had critical sections might be referencing this element B. Okay, the new ones can't possibly be, they're over here. So as soon as all the pre-existing reads had critical sections complete, then it is safe for us to go and destroy, free it up, do whatever we want to do with B, and then the list is the new version only. So here we've got six different steps, six different steps through time. And four of those have two different versions uh, and essentially split out in space, if you will, with the element B and B prime being that split. Uh, there was a lot of concern some years ago among certain people that the Linux community couldn't handle this sort of thing, and I, I give this graph as a counterexample. Uh, the Linux community has done quite well with RCU. Um, on the other hand, it's good to keep this in perspective. If we were to plot the number of, uh, this is just the number of mentions of the RCU API in the Linux kernel, um, executable statements, not comments. If we were to do the same thing for locks on the same graph, um, as you can see, uh, you know, there's, you know, and that's what you'd expect. RCU is kind of specialized and it's used in the special circumstances that it's required in. I don't expect to ever see those two lines cross. Um, you can get a different view of it just by plotting a log scale, and, uh, and it looks like we're getting, these slopes here are getting pretty close to the same, and we're at about somewhere around four or five percent of the synchronization primitives of RCU, and it looks like we're getting to the point where we're kind of hitting equilibrium. But we'll see how it goes. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna go back to how RCU went bad over a period of 15 years, um, and we're gonna focus on the RCU read side. Uh, just because, uh, you know, unless you guys have much better data rates than I do, you're not going to be able to pull in the whole RCU in, in the remaining, you know, 30 minutes. Before Linux, this thing was really simple, all right? I mean, I, I, I challenge you 
to make it primitive with a simpler implementation than that one up there, those two up there, right? Pound sign define, RC read lock, parent, parent, new line. Pound sign define, RC read unlock, parent, parent, new line. Uh, this implementation has a number of pretty profound advantages from a software engineering and a performance viewpoint. I'll uh, let you guys volunteer a few of them if you'd like. Yeah. I'm sorry? You can flip on lock and unlock, and it's uh, pretty obviously screwed up, but it doesn't matter. You can use either one, and they do the same thing. But yeah. <laughs> I'll get to them, and then you, and then you. The compiler, <laughs> the, not only is the compiler really good at optimizing, the compiler doesn't even see it. But yes, uh, Rusty? I was going to say, it's really hard to screw up the APEC. That's true. But I'm sure we'll figure out a way to do it. <laughs> really hard to screw up the APEC, you was saying. OK, um, so I kind of made a list of them. You could make any number of lists. Um, you, you get <laughs> Yeah, you know, good performance. It's not bad scalability. and Real-time latency is all right. And uh, uh, people complain about deadlock and live lock. And these, it's going to be pretty hard to, to deadlock this. It is possible, but it's hard. Yes? Memory consumption is pretty good, too. That's true. The uh, memory consumption is quite good. Uh, uh, unless your compiler is doing something really strange, you have a very small uh, text footprint. Yes? Um, it is easy to understand that part of the implementation, yes. <laughs> um, I'll be asking you questions on the next couple of slides, so <laughs> uh, go ahead. It's a good size optimization. It's a great size optimization, yeah. Okay, so uh, it, there's some nice things about this approach. Uh, and uh, there's a furniture salesman uh, since retired in my hometown whose uh, advertising motto is free is a very good price. And I, I think that applies here as well. Now, um, the gentleman over there, here's your question. The readers are doing absolutely nothing. So how is the writer supposed to know when they're done? They can't. That's one opinion. Any others? Yeah. Yeah, this guy, this guy's been here before. Very good. Good show, Jeremy. Through a schedule. Through garbage collection? Through garbage That's another way to do it. Actually, the first thing kind of sort of like RSU was published in 1980 by H.T. Kung, and I forgot the layman's first name, and it talked about using a garbage collector as a sort of an RCU, kind of. But uh, schedule was, is, in fact, correct. This sort of do-nothing reader only works in Linux kernel if you compile with bang config preempt, if you have a non-preemptible kernel, so that the threads can't be preempted, and the only way they're going to let go of the CPU is to explicitly schedule. The second hint, and we'll, we'll, we'll give you another shot here, is if you're in the kernel with this compilation, you're not allowed to preempt or block while you're holding a spin lock. And the, there's a standard self-deadlock that happens when you do this. The uh, guy who's holding spin lock, he blocks. He's off on the uh, wait list somewhere. And then all the CPUs get tied up with people that are spinning on that same lock. And uh, well, they aren't going to get the lock until the guy releases it. He's not going to release it till he gets the CPU to run on. And they aren't going to let go of the CPU till they get the lock. Uh, and things go downhill pretty quickly after that. So the rule is, if you're in a kernel, if you're holding a spin lock, you aren't allowed to block. And, and if you try doing this, by the way, you'll get scheduling while atomic messages. So it's not, it's, uh, it lets you know about it. So the trick is you simply declare it illegal to block while you're in an RCU read side critical section. So just like a spin lock, if you're holding a spin lock, you can't block. If you're in an RCU read side critical section, you cannot explicitly block either. So you want to take another shot? Ah, oh, come on. Um, this is a diagram showing how it works. And so what we've got is we've got some CPU that removed an element for a list. After removing it, it probably wants to free it up, but it'd be really bad form to free it up while there's readers still looking at it. But we have this rule. You're not allowed to block while you're in an RC read side critical section. So as soon as CPU zero blocks, it's going to do a context switch. As soon as we see CPU zero do that context switch, we know that all of the read side critical sections before that have to have finished. 
because you're not allowed to block in a retail critical section. And we have, remember, we have bang config preempt, so there's no, not going to be any preemption either. The same thing applies to CPU2. As soon as we see this context switch right here, all three of these critical sections have to be done. The fact that we can't see any sign of them directly is immaterial. We get this indirect evidence from the context switch. And the same thing with CPU2. So once we remove the element from the list, no new readers can find it. As soon as we see each CPU go through a context switch, we know that all the readers that might have been accessing it are done. Either that or somebody blew it and made a bug in an RC retail critical section. So as soon as we see all, each CPU go through a context switch, we know there can't be any readers referencing it. At that point, we do whatever we want with it. Free it up, rewrite it, whatever. So that's, uh, that's classic RCU, and that's the sort of thing you go through when you're doing the zero overhead read side. And uh, I, we go through a lot more detail. Um, there's a bunch of stuff you can look at uh, to go through some of the implementations and uses and so on. Uh, but we're going to talk more about uh, uh, redeeming, uh, getting simplicity through optimization in this talk. OK, so once we got to Linux, things got a little bit more complicated because uh, we had this config preempt parameter. And, and you might actually enable it, in which case, well, it's still pretty easy. RC read lock, instead of being empty, becomes preempt disable. RC read unlock becomes preempt enable. And that way, we can't be preempted in RC read side critical section because we said not to be. And, and uh, we're not allowed to block. And so things work fine. And things did work fine for some years. And then came this thing called the dash RT patch set. That RT stands for real time. And real time means that you have to be able to schedule quickly. If, if there's some really high priority task that wakes up, you need to run it really quickly. And really quickly, in this context, means tens of microseconds. OK? And that means to achieve that, you have to be able to preempt RC read side critical section, because there's some RC read side critical sections that are longer than that. So have, to have any chance at all of meeting that deadline, you have to be able to preempt the RC readers. That means, of course, that you might see context switches in RC read side critical sections. And that means we can say goodbye to uh, that uh, approach we talked about recently. Uh, we, we are not going to have zero overhead RC read side, lo RC read lock and RC read unlock. We're going to have to do something explicit. We're going to have to be able to tell the readers are there. And so this is where a lot of the complexity came from. And so what we did was we just had counters. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on this. We'll just kind of go through an animation of how it worked. And at the end, there'll be a URL if you want to dig deeper into it that, uh, that'll be a place to start from. But generally what we do is each CPU has a pair of counters. One of them is for the current grace period, and the other one is for the previous grace period. Okay. Uh, so in other words, let me put that more clearly. This counter is for readers that come in and start during the current grace period. If they start during the current grace period, you don't have to wait for them. The ones that started during the previous grace period were in effect when you started, therefore you do have to wait for them. And so each task, when it goes into RC reset critical sections and it increment the current, the CPU's current counter, it's going to remember exactly which counter it incremented. And when it comes to the matching unlock, it's going to atomically decrement that same counter, even if it's on some other CPU by that time. When, because, of the, because of the fact it might move from one CPU to the other, we have to use atomic instructions. We also keep track of uh, nesting. And the reason we do that is that just the outermost RC read lock and RC read unlock actually have to go through this mess. So when we start off, there are no re RC restart critical sections. All the counters are zeros, and, and that's where we start. Let's suppose that task A enters a restart critical section and happens to be running on CPU 2. Well, we take the current counter, we increment it atomically, and we get 1. OK, straightforward enough. Next, task D does the same thing on CPU 3. Again, we increment the corresponding counter. So we used to have a 0 there. Now we have a 1. And then task C does a synchronized RCU. Synchronized RCU says, start a grace period and wait for it to finish. So what synchronized RCU does is flip the counters. It actually just flips an index, but let's just flip the counters for now. 
And that means that task A and task D are now in the previous batch, the batch that has to be waited for before this grace period can end. And, uh, uh, and the, anybody new coming in is going to be in the current count. So that means these counters, the previous count counters, can only decrease. They cannot increase. Any increments will be happening in the current count stack. That isn't exactly right, but we'll stick with that for the moment. Task B, if it comes in, is going to do the current count by one. And then uh, if there's an RC read unlock with task D, it just decrements the same counter it had before. And then when A does the same thing, at that point, all the previous counters are zero. So synchronized RC says, aha, everybody who was there before I started is done. Therefore, I can return and let the person go again. And of course, to finish up, uh, task B eventually leaves a critical section and the counter goes to zero. The problem with this approach to life is that it requires atomic instructions, memory barriers, and a fair amount of stuff in the implementation. Uh, there's the URL, by the way, if you want to go into detail on it, I'm not going to. Um, so here is RC read lock. I'm not going to go through this in any detail. I'm just going to call attention to memory barriers and atomic instructions in it, uh, and the fact that it's, we've gone from one line to 21 lines. So to get this going, we had a factor 21 source code bloat. And that's just RC read lock. RC read unlock is similarly large. It's only 17 lines instead of 21, but it also contains memory barriers and uh, atomic instructions. Uh, and also branches taken in the common case. So this is kind of painful. It's what we used initially, and it got the job done, but you know, uh, you'd like to do better. The way we did better was uh, we, the problem we had was that if you got migrated to some other CPU, you still had to go back and reach into your previous CPU's counters which meant we had all the atomic instructions. And so the big change we made was that you just remembered the index, you know, previous or current, zero or one, and then you did the decrement on whatever CPU you were running on, okay, rather than going out and hitting the CPU you started on. And so uh, we have a similar sort of sequence going on. We start off with everybody not doing anything. We uh, increment task A comes in and increments CPU one's counter. Task D does CPU 3. Task C does a switch, and this may have been a little subtle. What I did, I didn't want to uh, switch the things like I did last time, so we have previous count and current count swap columns there, if you saw that. Um, so they, they flipped. That means that uh, task A is now preempted and it resumes on CPU 2. Okay, so remember that. Uh, task B does its lock and it does the other column again, so we don't have to wait on it. It's in the other column. It's not one we're waiting on. Task D releases its lock. It's still on the same CPU. There's been no preemption, so it just counts back down to zero. And then uh, task A, remember, is now on CPU 2. It was on CPU 1 before. Now it's on CPU 2. It's not going to mess with CPU 1 because it's not going to do any atomic instructions. So, it decrements the CPU's number it's on, and we end up with a negative one there. But that's okay. This column adds up to zero, zero plus one plus minus one plus zero, so synchronous RCU realizes, oh, okay, everybody was there before is gone now, so I can go back to what I was doing before. And then uh, task B, of course, finishes things up, and there's some more info, information there uh, on that. But uh, as you can guess, uh, well, we did save two lines there. We came down from 21 to 19. And we got rid of all the memory barriers, and we got rid of the atomic instructions. But we got a lot of code there. And not only that, but, but we got array indexes, and there's, uh, there's a bunch of places where we're, where we're constraining the compiler. Um, and there's address generation interlocks. If you have CPUs that don't have really aggressively optimized pipelines, this, this code is, 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 is ugly if you want it to run really fast. And uh, RC read unlock actually got bigger. I mean, we got rid of all the atomic operations. We got rid of the memory barriers, but it's, it's larger. And there's a bunch of things that are, that are still bad in the code. So what the heck do we want? Well, I think uh, you've probably listened to me long enough, even now, to know we don't want atomic operations. Okay? You've probably also heard something about not wanting memory barriers. Now, both of these things are faster than they used to be on modern CPUs. Uh, there's a number of recent CPUs that do really well in optimizing, but still they're a lot slower than just normal instructions. So we want to avoid them. We don't want cache misses. We don't want to be held up waiting for those. 
and those have not gotten much cheaper. We also don't want branch misprediction. Branch misprediction by itself isn't a big deal, but the thing is is that a uh, aggressive CPU will have executed down the wrong path for a while. It will have decoded the instructions, it will have maybe even speculated, executed, speculated down that path. Suddenly realize, oh man, I'm supposed to be over there instead. It has to throw away all this work, and now its pipeline is empty, so it has to start and wait for all this stuff to trickle through the pipeline before anything starts happening again. So you don't want to be doing that either. What we do want is we want the things running at full clock rate. We don't want to use complicated instructions. We don't want to run into any, any of these hazards. And we don't want five independent RCU implementations in the kernel, all right? <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, the more the merrier, I suppose, up to a point, but, but uh, we're, we're getting beyond merry at that point. Uh, finally, I don't want university students learning RCU from uh, design of preemptive RCU. I'm not making this up. There really was a few profs and a group of students that got together, and they decided to learn the basics of RCU from the detailed design documentation of the most complicated RCU implementation known to man. <laughs> so uh, removing from the kernel hopefully helps prevent that. So we'll, we'll go through how we simplified things. The instant ratio is user level RCU implementations. Unless you have strange kernel features that are not present in Linux, user threads are always preemptible. You can't do anything about it. And uh, what happens, what you do about that, is you keep all your state on a per thread basis. And that's okay, there's a lot of implementations that don't have that many threads, so that's feasible. Uh, how many people have recently done a PS-EF on say, an eight CPU machine? Um, how uh, did it fit on one screen? <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> so uh, this might not be a good strategy <laughs> inside the kernel, okay? Might not be what you want. You might be waiting a while digging through all that stuff. Um, uh, but still, it'd be really good to go down that way because we had this module arithmetic and you couldn't tell which CPU is holding these up because you got positive and negative numbers you're adding up and it's, it's, it's ugly. You can't hierarchicalize it. You can't make a tree. I mean, just because this part came out zero, doesn't mean it's going to be zero forever because somebody might be switched over and decrement it. But what we can do is split the, split the accounting. We can focus one set of things on just the running tasks. So we're going to look at all the tasks that are currently on CPUs. And then we still have to worry about tasks that are blocked, but only if they blocked inside of RC read side critical sections. And the only way that's going to happen is if they go through a context switch. And context switches are pretty heavyweight anyway. So if you do a little bit of work, and you know, do it the simple way and just grab a lock and do something, that's not that big of a deal on a context switch. Because it's quite rare that RC read side critical sections actually get preempted. You need to be able to preempt them, but it doesn't happen all that often. Now, if we do it that way, we can put the tracking back on a, we don't have to have this add the counters up thing, and then we can, we can focus and break things into trees and use hierarchical representation. And this is the most important part. We can integrate it with hierarchical RCU, with tree RCU. Uh, by the way, the only reason I thought of doing this was because somebody really screwed up some performance measurements. Uh, they told me they had a benchmark that was uh, where some huge fraction of the CPU was an RCU read lock and RCU read unlock. And I didn't really believe them, but, but I figured I'd better start thinking about it in case they really had, you know, done that. Uh, and uh, by the time they told me, no, they'd messed up, I'd already figured out how to do it. So I said, fine, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, I'm not going to go into detail on this. Uh, unfortunately, I don't yet have good documentation, but I'll get it there. But uh, the trick is that we just have per task counters. And you can see task A, B, and C, and the numbers and parents after them. That's in the task structure. And the task owns it. It just increments it or decrements it. No atomic instructions, no memory barriers, no nothing. Now, if we actually do have to preempt a task and read side critical section, what we're going to do is we're going to put it on a list uh, associated with a group of CPUs. And this is split up like the counters were for the same reason, because we only want to wait on the guys that were preempted in the early RC read side critical sections. And that way, we can just track the running tasks and the guys that actually blocked, that really did block. So we have a fairly small amount of data to look through. Plus, we can split this into a hierarchy. 
Um, and uh, that allows us to actually handle hundreds of thousands of CPUs without killing ourselves, in theory. So we start off with everything zero again like we did before. I'm gonna run through this quickly. Um, so task A, well, they increment it to one up there. Task D, so all it changes is he kicks his counter up to one. Um, and when we have the synchronized RCU, we flip current and previous, okay? And then uh, if task A is preempted, we leave its counter the same, but what we do is we enqueue it on the node corresponding to the CPU it came from. So he's on a list there, and uh, he's blocked, and that's fine. We keep track, and we know he's in a read side critical section. We have to pay attention to him. Uh, task B just increments his own counter, but we could see the CPUs, and we knew the other ones were there, and he wasn't there yet, so we don't have to worry about him in the same way that classic RCU would. Um, now, uh, task D does this unlock. It did not block, and therefore all it does is decrement its counter. Now all we're doing is waiting on task A. Eventually task A runs again, and it sees, oh, I blocked, and therefore I have to remove myself from the list and decrement my counter. At that point, synchronized RCU sees that everything it was waiting on is done and can allow synchronized RCU to return. And then, of course, task B just decrements its counter. So the key thing, and, and uh, hierarchical RCU is documented, but uh, I'm still working on getting the other stuff in. I'll get there. Uh, you guys are the guinea pigs, I guess. This is the code for both RC read lock and RC read unlock. Uh, so it nicely fits on one slide. And RC read lock is just incrementing. The access once just prevents the compiler from splitting the uh, fetches up or coalescing uh, adjacent fetches and the barrier just prevents the, the compiler from leaking the critical section outside. Uh, unlock does the inverse of that, but uh, what it does is there's another task variable that's uh, the, uh, the uh, RC read unlock special, and that if you preempt a task and reset a critical session, you set some bits in there, and that way it can check that and, and do a bunch of ugly stuff to recover from that. Again, normally, you don't preempt tasks and re RC reset critical sections. Normally, you just do that if and you just drop out. So branch prediction should work fairly well in that case, and uh, not only do we, do, not, do we not have memory barriers and atomic instructions, we have a lot fewer instructions in general. Um, and uh, just pointing out that that does have some overhead when you do hit it. So read side, I mean, it's gonna depend on your hardware, okay? But uh, somewhere between two, two and three X faster than preemptible RCU, and the grace period's got shorter too. Uh, if you've actually studied Preemptive RCU's grace period mechanism, it'll be obvious why that is. They had a horrible state machine it had to deal with. Um, also, this implementation allowed classic RCU and preemptive RCU to be dropped from the kernel because between them, they did everything that preemptive and classic RCU did, but better, essentially, um, aside from code footprint, which is where tiny RCU comes in. And uh, this dropped uh, something like 2,000 lines of code from the kernel. Doesn't always happen that way, but it's nice when it does. Uh, of course, you want to take that in context, too. Um, it's worth looking at the historical trend, and the historical trend isn't actually all that good. Um, we've got uh, the kernel version, the minor 2.6 version, so 2.610 through 2.635, which we haven't got to yet, obviously. And you can see it's, uh, we did go down. This is the 2000 difference there, but uh, it's been pretty much up. On the other hand, um, the way I got this information is I just grep for any file that had RCU in its name in the source tree, which includes RCU torture. That's a test suite. So it doesn't seem fair to count the test suite against the implementation. Um, so that's not quite as bad, although it's, uh, yeah. But RCU trace was there too, and again, the tracing isn't really part of the implementation, so we can subtract that out. Um, another funny thing happened, there used to be list.h, which had list primitives and also the RCU list primitives. And that's not part of the implementation, it's a way of applying it to lists. And that got moved to RCU list at switch point. It suddenly got counted where it wasn't before. And so we can cut that out as well. But still, I mean, we're talking about a fairly large multiple and increase in code size. As always, uh, I can uh, defend uh, anything like that. Uh, we added more functionality, right? And in fact, there were quite a few things. Uh, the red things are there because they're those, the three red things are the things I wouldn't have thought possible before doing them. The rest of them were fairly straightforward. 
but uh, we have made a lot of do made do a lot of things. So it's hot plug CPU, Dynetix, things like that that did take a fair amount of uh, complexity to deal with. So again, I'm saying it's legitimate bloat, and I'm sticking by that story. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we start. Remember, this is an ugly slide of having lots of different versions of uh, implementations in the kernel. And uh, by getting rid of them, we chopped it out. But even this doesn't really give you a flavor of, of the change we made because there's a lot of common code. I mean, uh, tree RCU and tree preempt RCU are one piece of code with different plugins. So the reality is somewhat more like this. So it's, uh, it's a lot cleaner um, and a lot nicer. Uh, if there's more cleanup needed, there always is. But of course, uh, there's always the next step. There are still people asking for things in RCU. There's still things that need to be done. And unfortunately, there's quite a few of them already. These are the kind of the biggish things. These are some of the smaller cleanup things. And unfortunately, I'm afraid that I can promise you that uh, these will make the implementation larger and more complex. I might get lucky again, but uh, I got lucky once in 15 years, so the odds may not be good. Uh, back to the usual experience, probably, right? But this was a lot of fun while it lasts. <laughs> this doesn't happen very often. It's nice when it does. So what would, if I want to make it happen again, what do I do? The key thing is if you're doing something that for the first time that's never been done before, it feels really, it's really cool when you see, ah, there is a way to do this after all. And there's this tendency to fall in love with your first idea of how to implement it. The thing is, is there probably are, is more than one way to do it. And the odds are against the first way you thought of being the best way. And it, it's kind of hard to force that thought on yourself in the, in the, in the glow of discovery. But it's the hard cold, cold truth, I'm sorry, right? I mean, that's just the way it is. So what do you do? Uh, the most, impressive, most important thing is explain your code. If your code confuses people, um, you could probably make it better. And that would indicate that uh, there's still some improvement in RRC somewhere, I would guess. If the code confuses you, uh, that goes double, all right? Documenting your code is kind of a way of explaining it to a bunch of faceless people, and it works fairly well. It forces you to review your code, which can be very helpful. Kind of painful, not necessarily the most fun thing, but it can have really good results. Reviewing other people's code. There's a lot of clever people in this community, a lot of really impressive hackers. And uh, you know, it's not unusual to say, "Woo, I didn't know you could do that. That's kind of cool. And oh, I could do that in my code, too. And that's a good way to come up with improvements. Uh, helping people use your code, that's, uh, in my case, that's been a pretty uh, good way to come up with improvements as well. And uh, in this case, uh, coding RCU in, in user level in a, a similar functionality in a different environment was quite important as well. And uh, let's face it, it took three times to get RCU uh, real time right, assuming that uh, the way it is now is right, which uh, will ask me again in a couple of years whether that's true or right, right? Uh, final lesson is that parallelism need not be counterintuitive. And we're getting towards the end here. We just got a couple more slides. There's this body of thought that concurrency is just totally alien to the human brain, that, that it's really unnatural. And I argue that, that that's not true. I argue that uh, in the entire human history, if, you're, if you uh, think of evolution as the way things go, I, I am, maybe you don't, I would argue that uh, ability with concurrency was selected for very heavily through human history and before. I mean, this, this poor guy here, right? I mean, how much better shape would he be in if he'd been able to do two things at once? And if you don't like this kind of analogy, not everybody does, a lot of people don't, um, find a competent teacher with 30 or 40 kids in a class. I'll tell you, that teacher is dealing with serious concurrency. And believe me, children are much more complicated than CPUs. <laughs> um, if you think they do what you tell you, um, uh, have a kid and tell me, let me know how it goes, all right? <laughs> so I think part of what we need to do is kind of get over the fear. Uh, there is some natural, some, some, you know, some fear is legitimate. This is the usual IBM legal sponsored page, and, uh, and more questions, I'm happy to take them. We'll actually have to do questions just outside in the foray here if Paul's uh, willing to stick around. We do have another presentation in this room uh, in a few minutes. Okay. So thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you.
before I forget. <laughs>